There's a story about a painting that you found, isn't yes, there? Yes, that was my break. That, put that mic to your mouth and just share that story with us about a found painting. Tell us, tell us what happened with that. Well, I went to a call in northwest London in Kenton, and it's just a normal old call, really. Like this lady had a lot of big old tables and sideboards, which I couldn't even fit into my van. <laughs> Birds eye maple stuff, and uh, I was walking around looking because I never really didn't go to a call because it's not what you actually see that they're selling; it's what you get inside the door, and there may be something there, like grandfather clock or something that they didn't have any value. And so I was walking out, and there was this painting on the by the wall, resting without a frame. And I said to the lady, what do you think it is? What do you, do you want to sell it? She said, is it worth any? I said, yeah, I'll give you 10 pound. I actually had a quick analysis of it. And I thought, OK, that's a good painting. I know, because I can see the eyes, I can see the fingers. And I knew the basics of a good painting. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but anyway. I took it down, took it, bought it for 10 pound, put it back in my junk shop. And I said to the person there, look, don't sell it, but see what we can get for it. And I was out buying and selling all day, and uh, so you're buying. And when I got back, he said, well, we've been offered 60 quid, and we've been offered 100 quid by somebody else. And so the offer went up to 100 quid, a lot of money in the 60s. And so then I decided I would not sell it. I took it down to Sotheby's. You anyway, took Selby's? Sotheby's. Uh, yeah. Sotheby's, sorry. Yeah, I took it to Sotheby's, and it fetched... Uh, Two months after, it fetched seven thousand something pound, <laughs> and that way, I—that was my start in the sixties. I got myself a new shop in upmarket, Kilburn to Cricklewood, which wasn't wouldn't be upmarket today, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be, and that's that's where I, that was my big break. So, do, I, I mean, is there anything more about that painting? Do, do you know what it was to this yeah, day? Yeah, it was a Dutch it master. The, 16th century Dutch, ma Dutch master, uh, probably not a, the biggest artist in the world, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I wonder what it'd be worth now. Oh, I don't know. It's a bit like if you buy a house for. I wish I had all the money that I had for the houses I bought and sold in the in the 70s. So 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 really, financially, that that gave you the ability to. Well, what I did is I bought. It, it's funny. It's interesting what happens when you. You make a move and stay. The, the buying a place in Cricklewood, I bought a place called 34 Cricklewood Lane. And that changed my life because yeah. my brother, I let the, the two flats upstairs, and my brother actually met his future ex wife there. and His future ex wife? <laughs> and then. So, and my whole family started to, we had this big family from Kerry, which became our family. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting when you just do one thing and one thing else just happens to another thing. I didn't, you know. And it all came from an old, uh, old house in Kenton on a very miserable Tuesday, really. That 10 pound painting. Yeah. So anyway. I love that. So, so what then, music promoting, did it start as um, when you had that first venue, and you were very much into um, your country uh, uh, and that kind of yes. that kind of music, but did you start it? Were you always this could be business and pleasure, or or did it start as a pleasure thing? And then you thought, hang on a second, I could I could get into promoting here. Yeah, it was kind of like that. But I started as a I will do this and I'll do what I love doing, which was I used to go to. When I was doing really well in the furniture business then, I had 10 shops. I used to go to Nashville quite a bit and look at bands in there and look at, go to honky tonks and think, well, you know, nothing like this happens in London. There's no cold beer. If you went to a pub in the sort of 70s, 80s, you didn't really get a cold pint of beer. It was like warm ale or something. Really? Yeah, when it just wasn't, it wasn't refrigerated. <laughs> so. So I was in a, a club in Nashville, a live music place, a honky-tonk, with 
very basic place, but it had such a good, it had all the elements of the main fiddler, really, which I copied, and I got a camera, and I took pictures of everything that was in there, from the toilet to the stage. And uh, I, went, I came back to London and thought, this is, I want to change my life now. I'm going to do a music venue. And yes, I did do everything I liked to begin with, like obscure artists like uh, uh, people like Guy Clark in those days and uh, John Prine and people like that, which didn't really have a following. But it lasted for a year, and then the bank manager called me in and said, Vincent, I think you'd be better off to go back to the furniture business. <laughs> Really? Yeah. So. The irony. How I tell him every time I see him now at, some, at the charity. Do you still see him? I do. I said, Morris, do you remember the, what you told me? <laughs> <laughs> You've been right a few times, but you weren't right that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did, you, uh, how did you make the jump to the big festival? So for me, and, I, and I've got to say, and this isn't just sort of, um, you know, low in sunshine, as some people might say. For me, I'm 42. I grew up going to festivals in the 90s, your festivals. Leeds, well, not Leeds, Reading, sorry, Reading, Phoenix, and, and Glastonbury. I don't know that many people will know that you had a few years, uh, few years there. You've given me, personally, a lot of summers of happiness and joy that my friends and I still talk about now. But h how did you make that first step into the, what is now Leeds and Reading Festival? Well, what what happened to make that so work? So, 83 was a disastrous year at the Mead Fiddler because I was doing things like which was my hobby and I was creating a big overdraft in the bank. And then I, it happened by coincidence really, but I had a, a person with me called Karen that used to book, book the whole thing. She, she only came in when she felt like it. And so, there was somebody in the cellar that was working in the cellar called Dave Phillips. And he walked up one day, and I was angry. It was 12 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. And I said, he said to me, I can book this place. And I said, what do you mean? You're doing the cellar. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I know music. And as it happened, actually, he became a very big booker. And it ended up he was the one who booked wedding with me. Uh, he knew more about music than I did. Okay. And so we changed it. We thought, OK, I'm not doing it now for myself. We're going to do it for the venue, we're going to do it for, and I, I got a, a new team of people around me, but I think the main person that really changed it was a young chap called Dave Phillips. He was in those days a punk, and he knew everybody. He loved music, and uh, that's all he needed, really. I put the, actual, the whole business thing around him, and uh, we put everybody in there from. And so you were the business side, and he was the well, get, was get the right music in. I was also the creative side on, so I did all the older stuff like Johnny Cash and uh, people like Roy Oberson that played there and, you know, all those names of people like, but then we got so, we d I did one thing right, which is I actually looked after the artist. The sound was really good. The dressing room had showers in which you wouldn't get dressing rooms in, uh, in London in a, in a small venue. <laughs> you wouldn't get showers, you, so you, uh, Bands loved it, and American bands especially loved it. They thought this is fantastic. So, we uh, basically it was bands really that made it famous. And what what was there? Because I, I'm I'm being waved at here. I can't believe the time has gone. You you have promoted and put on uh, as I read everyone from Prince to Arctic Monkeys, Britney Spears. Which which moment in those festivals gave you the most joy? Which one did you just go, ah, this is brilliant? It's hard to say because, you know, I, I used to live in a world of, I, of disbelief and the next one is going to be the best one. So it's a, it came from really that sort of horrible Catholic upbringing. You never, never get above your raisins. <laughs> you know, no matter how good you are, just like get back in the queue. I always have that feeling. I still have it. You know, and Was hopefully it, it will stay. W was there someone that you always that you never booked, but you tried and tried and failed? Was there that one or two artists that you thought, oh, they got away? Uh, not really. I think I've booked a lot of them. Actually, I, I, I did. I, I did. 
people like Dr. John and Gil Scott Heron and oh, people Gil like Scott that, Heron. you know, I booked and, you know, he's a great host. So we got him, uh, he did seven nights at the Jazz Cafe and we got him out of it. I got two people in New York to get him out of this drugs den. He banned it arrived, but he hadn't arrived and we had sold out seven nights in the Jazz Cafe. And he was in some, in Harlem someplace and uh, we found him in this house and we cleaned him up and took him and he did, it did six nights, but the band did one night on their own. <laughs> and that was the last time we did Gil Scott Hearn. That is incredible. Uh, my, f my favorite artist, you say, was usually all people that are a bit like myself, a bit like John Martin was my favorite artist of all time. Who? who? John Martin. Oh, John Martin, yeah. 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 Beautiful guitarist. Yeah. John was a, a hopeless, hopeless character, but beautiful man. And you, you bought Prince to what turned out to be his last festival festival appearance. And mine. And and your, <laughs> your last <laughs> festival he appearance. He was instrumental in my last festival appearance for a while. Because because that it it went under after that, didn't it? You yeah, lost it it you make. lost on that festival actually. Didn't well, there you? was a recession. You know, I was doing I was doing Benny Kasim. I was doing a festival in Ireland. I property in Ireland. I, everything, everything crashed in two thousand and nine. I think it was. Yeah. So, but you know, do you? It's only money. Because I could talk for ages and ages, but it'd be rude to the people who drew on. There's two things I'd like to ask. Do you have any regrets? No. And uh, and that I think that says a lot because I, I could tell you all kinds of regrets I've had through my life, and I think that sort of says something about your your character. Uh, As a matter of fact, my closing tune at all the venues I've ever had is uh, No Regrets, the song by a French artist. I love that. And to close, for people here who are looking to, whether it's behind the scenes or work in festivals or live music, what advice would you give them or, or, or what traits do you think they should have or what do, you know, what do they need to do? Well, if you've got the energy to do it and uh, you've got a belief, then you've got to trust yourself and follow your instinct. You'll get people to tell you everything. Most experts sit on the fence and do nothing. I love that. Most experts sit on the fence and do nothing. You need to get off your ass and do something. But, you know, if you do it and you're passionate about it, you may do it wrong first time, but if you're still passionate, then you do it right again. You don't have to actually... It doesn't mean you need a lot of money. You just keep going and... Success brings the money. And I, and I think we can learn from your life. It's okay to get decisions wrong, but yes. you also need to create your own opportunities. Yeah, that, you shouldn't, that, that, shouldn't that's be worried from uh, being wrong. You just have to try and learn something from it, which several times I haven't done that myself, to be honest. <laughs> made, I've made many mistakes in my life. But... I'm still here, and I'm still energetic about the whole thing, and I, you know, who knows? You when know? are you going to retire? I remember saying it once, but it sounds a bit... Uh, when I'm six months dead... <laughs> <laughs> so. I won't say any more. Please give a huge round of applause. And thank you to thank Mr. You. Vince. Oh.